a kingdom prospers or fails, depending on the king's faithfulness to the Lord. Saul, David, and Solomon were all great kings, but God dealt differently with each one because of how they ruled their kingdom. Consider your life as your kingdom. Will God bless your kingdom or take it from you? In today's message titled, Ruling the Kingdom That Is Your Life, His Eminence Bishop Omega shows us how we are the kings over our lives and explains how we must live to be successful rulers. Today's message, which I think you will find very interesting because it is one <coughs> that is, I don't know if I've ever heard it put together like this, we're going to be covering the book of the kings, but today focusing on the first book of the kings. But if something has to be said, of course, there needs to be a little background as to why we're doing this and what it means. Did you ever wonder why the Bible gives us all of this history about certain kings? And it's information in it, which in many cases you could have gotten from secular history. So why is it included in the Word of God? Well, the Lord has a way of teaching us. And the Lord teaches us through the book of the Kings, I know most of, many of you will know, some of you will know that once upon a time it was all one book, then it was divided into, we won't get into that today, into 1st Kings and 2nd Kings, but today we'll be in 1st Kings primarily, and dealing with King Solomon primarily. Although, the reason the Lord gives us these stories in His Holy Word in the Bible is because each one of us, as you've heard me say before, each one of us, Individually, God has made a king. You may say, the, the women may say, but I'm a female, how am I a king? You are king, you are sovereign over your own life. And in this approach to understanding the word of God more in depth, God has given each and every one of us a kingdom over which we rule. That kingdom is our lives. And the secret, you'll see, to the kings in the Bible having a successful reign is the same key or secret to us having a successful reign over our kingdom, our lives. Thus the title, Ruling the Kingdom That Is Your Life. Ruling the Kingdom That Is Your Life. God has given these examples to bring out this primarily, that when you the king of your own life, if you're a female, the queen of the, you're the sovereign of your own life. When you submit to God and his domination of your life, then you will have a successful reign. Again, the book of the Kings is a lesson for all of us individually that so, however goes the king, so goes the kingdom. You will see that's the lesson in every single story in this book, the Bible, about kings. Whenever the king was submitted to God and his authority and his oversight, his leading and his rule, there was a successful reign, a successful kingdom. Whenever the king went against God's leading, God's uh, domination, God's rule, the kingdom failed. So, the expression goes, as goes the king, so goes the kingdom. It is the same thing with us. God has given us a nature to want to dominate. He's even said in uh, Genesis 1.26 that he's given mankind, male and female, dominion over his physical creation. So it is in us, take this the right way, it is in us to want to dominate, to want to rule. Well, God says, I've given each one of you the rule over your own kingdom, your lives. But God tells us, if you pay attention today, I think it's brought out very clearly. God tells us you will never have a successful reign over your kingdom, your life, until you've learned to submit to God as the dominant force, the dominant influence in your life. God is to be the one we submit to, to have authority and dominion over us while we rule our kingdom, our lives. Please pay attention as we focus in on Solomon because he's a perfect example of from the beginning of his kingdom, actually before it even started, when David was still alive, his father David was still living. You'll see that we're going to mark or notice three marks 
of a successful reign over your kingdom. First, your kingdom must be submitted to God. It must be a gift by the hand of God to you. It must be something that you have submitted to in terms of God's rule in your life. That's number one. The second mark of a successful kingdom will be wisdom. There must be some manifestation, some evidence of wisdom. And the third mark that we'll see highlighted today will be orderliness. He is not a God of confusion. A well-run kingdom, your life, a well-run kingdom is orderly. It has order in it. And you're going to see as we use Solomon's kingdom and life to illustrate how we are to run our lives, you're going to see that the reason we see these stories about the kings in the Bible is really God telling us this is how your life is supposed to be. And let me tell you this, no king can ever expect to rule a successful kingdom unless he is submitted to the word of God and God's leading. And if you think you will ever run your lives successfully without submitting to God's authority, to God's word, you are sadly mistaken. Let me tell you this. God took this little country called Israel, and if you will, set it up on a stage, the world stage, so that all the world may watch and see. This is how God deals with a people when they are submitted to him. They are prosperous. They have a wonderful uh, kingdom. They are uh, the, the light of the world, if you will. But when they do not, God, as we spoke of before, God is also impartial in punishing, and God will come and correct. So when God went down among the Gentiles, took out Abraham, and on down the line, finally came to David and made a kingdom, well, started with Solomon, but he, the king he actually wanted, uh, David, and started a kingdom. God shows us through David and Solomon what it's like to live in sync with God and have a successful kingdom slash life. This is what we are all to do. This may be somewhat uh, tricky to follow until you see where we go by using Solomon as an, as an example. The kingdom of our lives is to be ordered by the Lord. If you yield to God's domination, you are given reign over the er all areas of your life. If you refuse his dominion in your life, you cannot under any circumstances fulfill your desire to be the authority over your life. This is what the book of Kings is all about. When we see successful uh, reigns of kings, it's because they were submitted to God. Notice the northern king of Israel, after they divided, the kingdom of Israel divided, it became Israel, it became Judah. None, none of the kings of the northern kingdom were God-fearing. They were all wicked. The kings of the southern kingdom, Judah, some of them were God-fearing, although all had faults. Some were God-fearing, but they had successful reigns in their kingdoms because they submitted to God to some degree. But the northern kingdoms did not. The northern kingdom did not, and all were wicked. But the book of the kings is not just to give us carnal history, which we could have gotten anywhere. It's to show us something. God is showing us that when you let him, when we let him dominate our lives, you will have a successful run of it. You will have a successful reign over your own kingdom. Again, what is your kingdom, your life. Who is the king? You are. So what you will and what you allow in your life, what you will to be, that represents you, the king. You'll notice when Solomon started out, Solomon was submitted to the Lord and loved the Lord. But a lot like us, many of us, when we start out with the Lord, we're submitted to him and we love him. But many of us do the same thing Solomon did. Some of us hold on to something which will end up destroying your kingdom unless you let it go and completely submit to God's reign over your life as David did. And notice when Solomon mess up, messes up, it'll say he did this, he did this, except 
he did not follow the Lord in all things like his father David did. Someone will say, but didn't David really mess up? And didn't David do two of the worst sins, murder and adultery? Yes, but the difference is when David repented, David had an inner yearning for the Lord's rule that David wanted God's will to be done in his life. And David, if you read Psalm 51, the 51st Psalm, you'll see create in me a clean heart, renew in me a right spirit. David wanted God's rule in his life. And David was willing to say, Lord, I'll give it all up. I was wrong, I repent. Where Solomon, who began loving the Lord, started out loving the Lord and still in some way, all through his reign, still in some way loved the Lord until he turned on the Lord and went after other gods. But Solomon did have something in him that loved the Lord. And you'll see the scripture makes it very clear he did. Now, before we get too tied up into Solomon, I want you to consider whenever you hear Solomon or the king, think of yourselves. Is there something in you, though you love the Lord, I love the Lord, is there something in us that you're still holding on to which could be your downfall in your reign over your kingdom, which is your life? Because believe it or not, if you hold on to it, sooner or later, it will destroy your relationship with the Lord. Now, someone will say, but I'm still saved. I didn't say you wouldn't be saved. Solomon, as much as he messed up, the Lord, because of his grace and because of his love for David, still saved Solomon. But Solomon turned wicked because he would not let that seed that was planted, that evil that was planted in him early in his life, he wouldn't let it go. And this story today, as we, we're going to jump through King Solomon's life, not read every scripture, but show you how it was established by God. God gave him wisdom. And then there was order or orderliness in his life. But his downfall was that he held on to something and wouldn't totally devote himself to the Lord, as did his father, King David. And that's the difference. No, David's sins were not excused. David paid for them. He paid for them as the Lord said he would, that they were, the sword would never leave his family. But when David repented, God forgave him. God loved on him. And don't forget, David, God himself said David was a man that after his own heart. David's inner yearning, his private inner yearning, was that God's will be done in his life. And when David repented, he was so sincere and didn't follow up on that sin, those sins, that he uh, so offended the Lord with. David was so sincere, you remember David said, I sinned against heaven, against you alone. David saw it that, that, uh, it was, that it was that serious that he sinned, of course he sinned against Uriah. Of course he sinned against Uriah's wife and took Bathsheba to his own, to his, as his own wife. But David saw it so, uh, such, as such an offense that he told God, I sinned against you, against heaven only, meaning David's inner yearning, his private yearning for the Lord was unlike Solomon's, which Solomon had all the outward appearance, and he was in, inwardly, he loved the Lord, but he had all the outward appearance that you would admire. As don't many saints today, they have the outward appearance, many people you know today, but I'm asking you today, are you holding on to something in your life that could be the seeds of your destruction? Pay attention to this today, and we'll see how Solomon is the perfect example to show us how the book of Kings is there for primarily one reason, not just to give us uh, carnal or natural, I should say, history, but it's also there to show us when you are in alignment with God, when, you're, when your life is lined up with God's thinking, and God is the one that runs your, your mind and your he leads you, you will have a successful reign over your own life. That is the story, that's the lesson, I should say, that we get out of these stories of all the kings in the Bible. Notice all the wicked ones. And some of them were naturally prosperous, but notice all the wicked ones God showed his displeasure with, and they ended up in destruction. Those who the Lord had grace on that showed some modicum of love for him in their lives as was a Solomon, though he turned wicked in his latter days, the Lord has a way of dealing with and forgiving those who show him some kind of real yearning for him. The Lord will forgive you. 
But let us look at this, and we're going to pick up, and I'm going to reference a lot of it, and you can read it in your own time. But we're going to begin here in the first book of Kings, in the first chapter, I'm just going to reference it, where David is still on the throne, but uh, he's met with rebellion in his dying years. David is dying, and he's still on the throne, but David is in alignment, he's, in al he's uh, doing exactly what God wants. So when David has proclaimed that Solomon shall be king, this is David exhibiting the will of God. However, there's a rebel on the scene, Solomon's brother, Adonijah. And Adonijah begins a rebellion to try to make himself king in place of Solomon. But Solomon is God's desire to succeed David. So we're going to see here, before you even begin your kingdom rule, that is to say, before you take charge of your life, it has to, first of all, first of all be in submission to God's will. We're going to use Adonijah to show you how you can't force your will on God. So even in your own lives, our own lives, we can't force what we want to be on God and have God approve it. It's going to be God's way one way or another. But we're going to begin here, if you will, in your own time, read from verse 1 in, the chap in chapter 1 of Kings, 1 Kings. David's on the throne, and Adonijah begins a rebellion. He gets people to come to him, and it seems like he's going to be very successful. And you'll see that David... Although he's getting older, someone got to David's ear and said, your son Adonijah has proclaimed himself king. David says, go get Solomon, give him my mule. He got the right priest. He got the, the prophet, Nathan, and Zadok, the priest. He got them to come and proclaim and walk him around and call Solomon, put him on the throne while I still live. So if you will, there was a dual kingship at the same time. David was still on the throne but dying, and he knew he was dying. But he's setting it up according to God's will. How does that relate to us? Your life has to be set up according to God's will. You can't force your way, your will on God, Adonijah. So David begins, and I'll bring you to chapter 2. Now the days of David, verse 1, the days of David drew near that he should die. And he charged Solomon, his son, saying, this is the first thing, I go the way of all the earth. Be strong, therefore. This is David giving Solomon instruction. You want to have a successful kingdom? Be strong, therefore, and prove yourself a man. And uh, keep the charge of the Lord, the Lord your God, to walk in his ways, to keep his statutes, his commandments, his judgments, and his testimonies, as it is written in the law of Moses, that you may prosper in all that you do and wherever you turn that the Lord may fulfill his word, which he spoke concerning me, saying, if, you, if uh, your sons take heed to their ways, pay attention to what they do, to walk before me in truth with all their heart and with all their soul, he said, you shall not, this is what God told David, you shall not lack a, lack a man on the throne of Israel. Notice what David just did. David is, first of all, putting in place what God wanted. God wanted Solomon. So he brings Solomon aside and says, son, if you want to have a successful reign over your kingdom, pay attention to God's word. Follow that fully. Don't veer from it. Stay on track. You will have a successful reign. And not only that, your sons that come after you will be successful. So how does that apply to us? Before you begin your life, the control of your life over your kingdom, your reign over your kingdom, make sure you have God's word at the center of all that you think to do, of all that you want to do, of all that you uh, propose to do. If you don't see the word of God as being the ultimate source of what is right, you're already starting off wrong. So David was king to tell Solomon, listen, I'm dying, going the way of all the earth, meaning this is what happens, this is what happens to everyone. But son, Make sure you put God first. And you notice he took him back to Moses, the law of Moses. Today we would say, listen, follow the word of God, all that's in God's word. The way you look at your life, the way you uh, conduct yourself with other people, is it based on scripture? The way you order your life, is it based on God's word? The way you reason, what you think is good and what you think is bad, 
Is it based on what the Bible said is good and is bad? You know, when we get to the part about uh, God giving Solomon all that wisdom, remember even the New Testament agrees. In Hebrews, the fifth chapter 12 and verse 12, down to verse 14, especially B, where it ultimately says, by now you should be teachers. You've been with God so long, you should be teachers of the word and you have still need to be taught. And the ultimate thing was that if anyone is really taught by God's word, Hebrews 5, 14b, it says you will be able to dis distinguish, discern good from evil. That's the ultimate goal of a person who is God-fearing, to be able to determine what is right and what is wrong. If you want a successful life, if I want a successful life, anyone, and you want to please God, you should be able to know his word well enough to be able to tell in general what's right and what's wrong. That's, you know, if you read Hebrews, you'll see that's the bottom line, to be able to discern good from evil. Even when Solomon is asked, what can I, God says, what do you want? Solomon asked for the ability, ability to discern or judge God's people and to know what is good and evil, but he never asked for wisdom to know what is good and evil in himself. That was one of his downfalls. But what he did say pleased God because God said, well, you didn't ask for riches. So I'm going to give you wisdom. And then God tested him. We'll get to that in a minute and gave him more than what he asked for. But we'll get to that in a minute. Now, you'll see also that David dies. And uh, you go to verse 10 of the second chapter. David died and he reigned for 40 years. Uh, he went on and passed. And Solomon gets to the throne. Now, Solomon begins to, I'm, I'm just giving a quick overview. Solomon begins to solidify, or yes, solidify and consolidate his throne by getting rid of a lot of his enemies. This was all in an effort to, to order, to get his life in order, his kingdom in order, I should say, his kingdom. For us, it's our lives. See how that works? He's the king, so that, that would be representing us, and he gets his kingdom in order. So when we come legitimately to position ourselves as king over our own lives, we have to do it with God's will, as David made sure Solomon entered his reign with God's will, with Solomon being on the throne, not Adonijah. And then God brings uh, 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 Solomon aside and says, now, what do you want? Let's go now to chapter 3 of uh, 1 Kings. Now, Solomon, this is where you're going to see him. Solomon planted the seeds that would eventually destroy him. Now, Solomon, this is after he consolidated his kingdom, got rid of a lot of his enemies, rightfully so. Now, Solomon made a treaty with Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and married Pharaoh's daughter. This is verse 1. Uh, then he brought that he brought her to the city of David, that is Jerusalem, until he had finished building his own house and the house of the Lord and the wall around Jerusalem. Meanwhile, listen to this, meanwhile people sacrificed, the people of Israel, sacrificed at the high places because there was no house built for the name of the Lord until those days. And Solomon loved the Lord walking in, in the statues of his father David, except that he sacrificed and burnt incense at the high places. What does that mean? Well, he planted, you can see him planting the seeds of his destruction by first of all doing something God said don't do, marrying foreign women. This does not mean today you can't marry people that are not of your ethnicity. God, we'll get to that later, makes it clear the reason he didn't want his people marrying foreign, foreign women is because they had false gods. And God said they will eventually pull you away from me. But notice what's going on here. There was no temple yet built. So where, do you, where did they in those days offer worship? They were supposed to go and stand before the Ark of the Covenant, which was in a tabernacle that David built, which was in Jerusalem. But this is before the temple, so there was no temple. But notice it said Solomon offered sacrifices at the high places, and so did the people. The people did not go to offer sacrifice. They didn't go worship where they were supposed to. What they did was overtook the places of false gods. I have to give you some history here. Please bear with me. 
When they came into this land, there were high places, hills and mountains, where the pagans had their worship. When the children of God came in, the people of God came in, children of Israel, they went and overtook those places and dedicated things to God, but in the place where idolatry was formerly practiced. David, however, when he brought the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem, he put it in the tabernacle, and David went there, as was uh, prescribed, and offered worship and sacrifice there. That is where the people should have been offering sacrifices, and Solomon as well. But some of them kept to their old traditions, not submitting completely to God's word, and kept sacrificing, although to God, but at those false places of worship. So, notice, meanwhile, the people sacrificed, meaning before there was a temple built, the people kept on sacrificing in those high places, and so did Solomon. He didn't do like his father David did. David went and offered sacrifices at the, before the Ark of the Covenant and in the tabernacle, where he was supposed to. Why are we saying all of that? Because Solomon is holding on to, though it says he loved the Lord, and, the, uh, and uh, uh, verse three, and Solomon loved the Lord, walking in, in the statues of his father David, except that he sacrificed and burnt incense at the high places. So, like a lot of saints today, you love the Lord, but you hold it, you're holding on to something that's not right with God and that will eventually be your downfall if you don't let it go. But notice David, you'll see in another place, David did his worship and his sacrifice where he was supposed to. Solomon did not. Solomon also made a marriage treaty with Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Egypt is always a metaphor for the world. So what do we see? Solomon starting off his kingdom, as a lot of people do, when we start off the rule of our own kingdom, our own lives as adults. A lot of us will start off well-intentioned toward the Lord, but holding on to something that's just not right. Solomon brought in to the holy place a woman that he was not supposed to, which also represented the world. Egypt always represents the world. So what are we saying? Solomon brought into his worship, into his love of the Lord, some of the world with him, unlike David. David, he didn't, he didn't follow the statutes, he didn't keep the word of God just like his father David, of course we know, except the two instances of murder and adultery which David atoned for and repented for, but still suffered for. But the heart of Solomon was slightly different, somewhat different from David. And you see here at the, in the inception, at the beginning of his kingdom, in chapter 2 you'll read how he solidifies his kingdom, gets rid of his enemies, even Adonijah, and now Solomon is firmly on the throne. And now that he's sitting firmly on the throne, ruling his kingdom, when do we begin to rule our kingdom? When we become adults and we become uh, responsible for our own lives, some of us still hold on to something which could be your, your downfall. As Solomon, starting off, makes a treaty, someone will say, well, he made a treaty so he could have peace on that border and that border. God could still give you peace, but obey him. God said, don't marry the daughters of foreigners because they will draw you away from me. He didn't ask you to give the excuse, but I need peace on this border. God says, I can give you peace, but keep my word. So you can see here from the beginning, Solomon violate, he, he's starting off his kingdom, loving the Lord. It says he loved the Lord in verse three of the third chapter of 1 Kings. He loved the Lord, but you see, what did he bring with him? Baggage. He brought with him the world, Pharaoh's daughter, representative of the world. He brought with him the world into his walk with God, his reign with God. What else did he do? He kept on sacrificing in the high places rather than going to where he was supposed to. How is that analogous to today? Some people still come and worship and still have something in their heart that's not right. You're bringing into this, this very uh, holy place, the place where we worship God, you're bringing something from the world in. I don't know, was it hatred, uh, resentment, animosity, something towards your own brothers or sisters or somebody? You're bringing something of the world. It could be some uh, you know, sexual perversion, uh, some uh, uh, criminal behavior of yours, something that's keeping you from coming in fully. Solomon starts off his kingdom, but notice it says this, 
and Solomon loved the Lord. Do you see how analogous that is to many today? You can still love the Lord and still bring some world in with you. Now, that's not having the heart of David because David was a man of God's own heart. And David knew when he was wrong and, and separated himself from those things which were not like God. And he called himself out, if you will. Again, read the 51st uh, Psalm when he says, create in me a clean heart. He knew he was wrong. Renew in me a right spirit. Lord, don't take your joy from me. Solomon starts off his kingdom loving the Lord and having it set up by the right, the right way by having uh, David set him on the throne. So God ordained it. it was, he was in submission to God. He started off right doing everything correctly. But here's where a lot of saints, even today, people, your downfall can be. Our downfall can be. If you want to hold on to something from the world, Pharaoh's daughter, representing the world, Egypt, and also sacrificing still in the high places. And Solomon knew he should have gone to before the Ark of the Covenant at the tabernacle that David built, that David erected, I should say. So he starts off Solomon loving the Lord. I want you to take this to heart. You can start off the reign of your lives loving the Lord, but when you bring with you something that's not like the Lord and you keep it with you, and you're going to see it gets worse for Solomon, but he loves the Lord and his reign is great, his reign is successful, but what did he do? He snuck something in, into that holy place. He brought it into Jerusalem. He brought her from Egypt back to Jerusalem, God's city, city of David. Um, among God's people, he brought the world, if you will, something from the world. And he kept on worshiping where he shouldn't have been worshiping. He should have been worshiping before the Ark of the Covenant. So something was wrong with his worship and something was wrong with his heart his deep heart, because he kept the world, some part of the world in there. So, but look at this, I like this. And we're going down to verse four of chapter three, first Kings. Now the king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there, why? For there was the great high place, there he is. Solomon going where he should not go to worship. Now mind you, he's not worshiping yet false gods there. He's worshiping God, but he's not doing it where he was supposed to do it. That was in front of the ark. So you see he's being disobedient to God's word, not fully following like David did. Although he's starting off his reign right, verse 3, he loved the Lord. Solomon sincerely and really did love the Lord. I want you, why am I repeating this? Because I want everyone listening to examine, don't you really love the Lord? And everyone's going to say, amen, yes I do. But are you still holding on to some part of Egypt? Are you holding to some part of the world and mingling it with your love for the Lord, your worship for the Lord? He says, yes, but I'm here worshiping the Lord. Yes, but you're doing it in the high places. What does that imply? You're bringing some wickedness in there with you. I often say this. Some people will come to church and look the part. Outwardly, they seem very, a lot to admire, just like Solomon. Outwardly, a lot to admire. But inwardly, there was something still not right completely. And as we are using in this analogy today, the king is you, the king is, in this analogy, is, is, is me, it's I. The kingdom is your life, and you'll notice Solomon's kingdom and his, and his throne is fine. While he's, and especially on outwardly, outwardly it appears fine, while he's walking with the Lord. Even the Lord comes to him in verse 4 of chapter 3 of 1 King. The Lord says, yeah, if you will, let me amplify. The Lord is saying he does love me. I see that. And doesn't he do that with us today? And the Lord is patient with us, as he will be with Solomon. And now the king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there. Why? For there were the great high places. The high, there was the great high place. A place where you shouldn't be worshiping. You should be in front of the ark, right? Solomon offered a thousand burnt offerings on that altar. At Gibeon, uh, at Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, ask, what shall I give you? What do we see here? The Lord knows what Solomon has in his heart. He knows he brought Pharaoh's daughter, the world, in. He knows that he's still worshiping where he shouldn't be, as many today worship in a place mentally where they shouldn't be. You should be in full submission to the Lord. But here you are bringing in part of the world, some people today, and you're still in 
some way not worshiping in the correct way. But the Lord comes to Solomon seeing some good in him, still being patient, still being merciful, as he is with each one of us today. And the Lord says, before you, or as you start your reign, what would you like me to give you? Let me put it this, let me read it as it says in the, in the New King James Version. And Solomon said, you have shown great mercy to your servant David, my father, because he walked before you in truth, in righteousness, and in uprightness of heart with you. You have continued this great kindness for him. You have given him a son to sit on his throne, as it is this day. Verse 7, now, O Lord my God, you have made your servant king, speaking of himself, you have made your servant king instead of my father David. But I am a little child, meaning I don't know what I'm doing yet. Although the Lord, you'll see in chapter 2, let him solidify his kingdom and get rid of a lot of his enemies. But Solomon's point is, I don't know it fully yet. I don't know fully yet how to run this thing. He says, I do not know how to go out or come in, meaning I don't know exactly what to do as king here. He's asking, Lord, and your servant, uh, where, is it, where am I? Verse 8. And your servant is in the midst of your people whom you have chosen, a great people, too numerous to be numbered or counted. Therefore, give to your servant an understanding heart to judge your people. Notice he didn't say give an understanding heart to judge himself. We'll get to that in a minute. I alluded to it earlier. That I may discern between good and evil, as Hebrews says, a proper understanding of God, God's word gives you the ability to understand or discern good from evil. For, for who is able to judge this great people of yours? The, now, what he said pleased God. The speech pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing. Then God said to him, because you have asked this thing, you have not asked for long life, you have not asked long life for yourself, nor have you asked for riches for yourself, nor have you asked the life of your enemies, but have asked uh, for yourself understanding to discern judgment or justice. The Lord says, look, see, or behold, I have given you a wise and understanding heart so that there has not been anyone like you before you, nor shall any like you arise after. This is now verse 13. And I have also given you what you have not asked. Notice this. God does this to all of us. God knew what was in Solomon's heart. No, Solomon didn't ask for riches. He didn't ask yet or, or seek yet uh, a thousand wives, that is to say 700 princesses or wives, proper wives and 300 concubines. He didn't ask for that yet. He didn't ask for gold. He didn't ask for riches, money, and that, no. He asked for a discerning heart that he may judge God's people, this so great a people. Who can judge them? They're so numerous. They're your people, God. God says, I like that. But God will often do this to us. He gave him what he asked, and he loved the fact that you didn't ask for riches, but God knows Solomon's heart. And he knows in Solomon is that vanity or that craving for the world and the riches that are in it. So God will test us often as he does with Solomon. God says, no, you didn't ask for it, but I'm going to give you riches. Some of them have said, that doesn't seem fair. Does it seem fair when God tests us? If something is really in your heart, watch out what you desire. God will often give it to you. And it will oftentimes be a test to see where you line up. Look at this. God says, verse 13, chapter 3 of 1 Kings. And I have also given you what you have not asked, both riches and honor, so that there shall not be any like you among the kings all your days. I'm going to make you the richest man on the planet all your days. So, listen to this. Now, here's the crucial thing. God says, I know what's in your heart, each one of you. Sometimes I'll give you what you didn't ask. But here's the key to passing my test, God says. God says at verse 14, so if you walk in my ways and keep my statutes and my commandments as your father David walked, then I will lengthen your days. That's, it sounds very simple, but it's right to the point. God says, you asked for wisdom, and I like that. That speech pleased the God, pleased the Lord. God says, but I'm gonna give you more than what you asked for. You didn't ask for riches. You didn't ask for the lives of your enemies. You didn't ask for a long life for yourself. You asked for wisdom. I'm going to give that to you. But God is saying, as he's doing to all of us, I know your hearts. And God will often test us, not, tempt, not make us go toward evil, but he'll put it. Didn't God say, see here today is good and evil choose? God does that because God is trying to pull out of Solomon 
that desire as David had to really want God to reign and rule in your life. God says, I know you didn't ask for those riches, but I'm going to give them to you. And no king, nobody else on the earth is going to be as rich as you are in all your days. And God knows with all this, it's going to pull out the other temptations, the other seeds of evil that's already planted in his life. Go back to verse 1 of chapter 3 when he married Pharaoh's daughter. God can see what's in your heart. You're already going after foreign women. God says that's going to pull you away from me. You were warned in Moses, do not go after and marry into those tribes, the peoples that I'm going to uh, have you confront once you cross the Red Sea and once you cross the Jordan. He says, don't marry them. Why? Not because there's something wrong with them. Not because God favors one ethnicity. God knows that they were all pagans. And no matter what you think, God says, if you bring the world with you, you will be drawn away from me. If you hold the world dear, you will be drawn away from me. Didn't Jesus tell us that in Luke 12, I believe it is 34, wherever your treasure is, that's where your heart's going to be. Solomon proved to all that his heart, that his treasure was where his heart went. And his heart went after those women that he said, do not marry. There was nothing wrong, I want this for the, I want this for the record. There was nothing wrong with them ethnically the thing God was against was their pagan worship of other gods and the, the morality that they would uh, develop and th that they would follow would bring them away from the one true God and the proper and only true worship. And God told Solomon, if you just walk in my statutes, yes, I know you didn't ask for these other things, but I'm giving them to you. And here's the way you avoid sin. Here's the way you avoid succumbing to the, the lure of the material things. He says, walk in my ways, keep my statutes and my commandments as your father David walked. Then I will lengthen your days. Then I'll bless you. But you must, those very simple things, just keep my word. It is the same with us today as we rule the kingdom that is our lives. As long as you walk in his ways, keep his statutes, you must say to yourself, saints, honestly, do I really agree with everything in the word? How many times do I have to go over this sermon uh, or say these things in a sermon? Do you really agree with everything in God's word, even when it cuts against you? If you do, then say amen and then live the life that God intended for us. Leave Egypt behind. Metaphorically, nothing wrong with Egyptians. I'm saying that, that the, the lure of the world, which is Egypt is a metaphor for, the lure of the world, if you bring it into worship with God, it'll never, they, how can two walk together except they be agreed? Remember that recently? Can two walk together except they be agreed? No. The world is not aligned with God. God makes it very clear. I will bless you. I will lengthen your days. You'll be blessed beyond measure if you just walk in my ways. Fancy way of saying, just keep some yieldedness to God. If you're not yielded to God and his reign in your life and his dominance in your life, you will never run a successful kingdom. Your kingdom is what again? Your life. Who is the king of your life? You are. Now, you, king, and if you're a woman, queen, whatever, you're the sovereign of your life, you, like these kings in the book of kings, had to learn that there's a king over you. So while you're running your kingdom, you have to be in submission to the king of kings. And if you let God run your life, you will run a successful kingdom, as David did, except in the matter of Uriah's wife. He got that. But you will run a successful kingdom. God will be pleased with you. And you'll see here, Solomon started out correctly. How do we know that? Look at the very next verse, verse 15. Then Solomon awoke. By the way, this is the most unique dream in the Bible. Because in all the other dreams, it was one way. Here is a unique dream because God allows a conversation. It's a two-way dream. Solomon was able to talk back to the Lord in this dream. But if you look at the dream of Genesis 26, 24, Genesis 28, 12, Genesis 48, 2, Daniel 2, 7, Daniel 7, 1, Matthew 1, 20, Matthew 2, 12, 19 and 22. All these dreams, I went kind of fast there, so maybe you all can, you can 
uh, uh, when you hit re re rewind or reverse and catch up on it. But all of those dreams were one way. My only point is that this one was unique. God let Solomon talk back to him in this dream. And God, he's loving on Solomon for the sake of David, and he loves Solomon. But this was a unique dream. And notice this. When Solomon awoke, don't forget I said Solomon started out correctly, lovely, except he brought a little of the world with him, and except he didn't have his worship place quite correct. But verse 3 of, of, ch of ch chapter 3 of Kings, 1 Kings tells us he loves the Lord. So he's starting off correctly. He consolidated his kingdom. He has some order going here. He's going to get more, but he has order going here. When, when uh, Solomon awoke from his dream, it says, and indeed it was a dream, meaning Solomon realized that was a dream, but I was actually talking to God. But notice what happened. Before he went to the high places in Gibeon, remember? He went to the high places of worship. Notice how he's starting off right. When he came out of this dream talking to God, where did he go? And, and he came to Jerusalem and stood before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. See? Before he was worshiping at the wrong place, at the high places. The false altars, of the, gods, the altars of the false gods, but worshiping to God. But David made it clear you're supposed to worship before the Ark of the Covenant at the tabernacle in Jerusalem. As soon as he comes out of this dream with God, Solomon's on the right track. He goes to Jerusalem, not Gibeon. Go back to verse 4, you'll see he, went, he was still going to Gibeon to worship. Why? Because they had high places there, false altars, which were converted to the worship of God. But no, coming out of this dream, talking to God, God promised to give him wisdom. And that, God says, see, I've given you, I've made you, let's put it in the vernacular, I've made you smarter than anybody before you, and nobody's going to be smarter that comes after you. But also, I'm going to give you what you didn't ask for, and that's a test for you, I'm amplifying. And that's a test for you, because that's what it actually uh, gets to. But now, look, at as soon as he comes out of his communion with the Lord, this dream, this two-way unique dream, this two-way conversation with the Lord, he awoke, and indeed it was a dream. And what did he do? He got on the right path and went to Jerusalem to worship before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, offered up burnt offerings, offered peace offerings, and made a feast for all his servants, for everyone that was in his kingdom that was with him. Now, immediately, I'm, not, I'm just going to refer to it, I'm not going to read it, but immediately God shows us the kind of wisdom he gave Solomon. We've heard it so many years now, it may seem old hat, but back then, and even now, it's still a brilliant way to resolve this dispute between two prostitutes. One had a baby, and the baby lived. The baby's fine. Another woman, both prostitutes, are living in the same house, and only the two of them are living there. So it's only her word against her word. And the other one, other prostitute, had a baby. But one night she slept, and roll, uh, three days later she had a baby, and she slept and rolled over on the baby and killed it. But then... She brings her petition, uh, the, the first woman brings her petition because that woman who rolled over on her baby, while the first woman was sleeping, she went and stole her baby and put her baby next to the, the first woman and said, that's her baby, while she's sleeping. And she took the live baby and said, this is mine. So the woman who had the, real, who, the first baby, whose baby was living, this is testing Solomon's wisdom, showing you, I should say, showing you Solomon's wisdom. She says, I'm taking my petition to the king. King Solomon, this woman stole my baby, and she killed hers, and she tried to switch the babies. And it, it boils down to this. You all know the story. It boils down to this. Solomon said, bring me a sword. Notice, as soon as we come out of the dream, communication with God, Solomon's mind is right, and he goes and worships at the right place. How's, how is this analogous to us? When many of us turn to the Lord and we're adult, oh, we, when, we, when it finally hits us who we are, we want to rule our kingdom and be just like the Lord, and we're starting off right. This is what Solomon did, and his kingdom is going to prosper because of it. But the Lord immediately shows us that Solomon went and worshiped at the right place, and then at verse 16, he shows us an example of the kind of wisdom he gave Solomon. Solomon said, I know in my heart, whosoever baby this is, they are not going to want that baby hurt. Solomon said, bring me a sword. Put the baby down there. Now, Cut the, sword, or cut the baby in half and give half to this woman, half to that woman. And the evil woman, the woman who stole the other woman's baby and lied, said, yeah, that's right. Let us split the baby. 
the real mother right away first said, no, 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 let, that, let her have it. Solomon, through God, was showing that any true mother would say, let my baby live, don't kill my baby, even if it means letting that woman have it, but don't hurt my baby. Every mother in the audience says, amen, you know you don't want your child hurt. So Solomon knew this, but it showed how brilliant, how, how, how bright, how wise God made him. That he knew, Solomon said, don't touch that baby in any way. Give the woman whose proper baby it is her baby back. Because this other woman is not telling the truth in so many words. But it showed Solomon's wisdom. Notice how this came right after his uh, involvement with the Lord. So he's starting off his kingdom correctly. Don't a lot of us do that? When you, quote unquote, get saved, or you're so determined to do right. And that's good. You should start off like that. And you should stay like that, though. Remember how David warned Solomon? Just walk in all the ways of the Lord. And the Lord warned Solomon, walk in all my ways, keep my statutes. Solomon's kingdom is, 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 is uh, uh, blossoming. And he's doing well. And he's showing his wisdom here as we move on uh, past, verse, uh, past chapter 3. You see, if you read all of it, I leave it to you to read all of it in detail. I just want to make these points how we rule our kingdom successfully, submission to God. Solomon right now is submitted to God and showed beautifully an example of his wisdom there. Solomon says, split the baby. No true mother wants that baby touched. So he showed who the real mother was. That was an example of his wisdom. Now we move on to, and in fact, let me share with you the kind of wisdom God gave uh, Solomon. Here in uh, Verse 29 of chapter 4. And God gave Solomon wisdom and exceedingly great understanding and largeness of heart like the sand of the seashore. Thus Solomon's wisdom excelled the wisdom of all the men of the east. You know that means all the men of China, Japan, all the far, uh, what is today's Burma, all the men of the east. Of course, this is about 500 years before Confucius, but this is even, he's wiser than even uh, Confucius would have been although Solomon's, as I said, about 500 years before Confucius, all the men of the East and all the wisdom of Egypt, what man knew then, in terms of uh, then scientific discoveries, whatever kinds of wisdoms were known in the world, Solomon knew better than all. Better than all the men of the East, all the wisdom of Egypt, for he was wiser than all men. Then it goes on to name a few men, but let's go down to verse uh, uh, 32. He spoke 3,000 Proverbs, and we have them in the book of Proverbs. You would imagine someone given all this wisdom would not in his latter years lack the wisdom to stay right with God. Goes to show you the frailty of human beings when you don't walk in lockstep with God's word. This is a warning to all of us who right now feel, yes, I'm in the church, I'm saved, yes, but you better stay focused on God and let him be dominant in your life or you will lose your kingdom or have it fail as Solomon had his kingdom fail. Listen, listen how wise he was. He left us 3,000 Proverbs and his songs were 1,005. Of course, we only have one. We don't know what happened to the others, but you know the Song of Songs or the Song of Solomon, that's the one song we do have of Solomon. And he spoke of trees, which means he knew so much about trees. Uh, from, the, uh, from the cedar, you know, the cedars of Lebanon, uh, even to the hyssop, uh, the springs uh, out of the wall, which springs out of the wall. He spake also of animals. Solomon knew inside out about all kinds of animals beyond any human being, of birds or fowl, of creeping things and of fish. He was just wise. And men of all nations from all the kings of the earth who had heard of his wisdom came to hear the wisdom of Solomon. Why did I say all that? Because as I say with Hebrews 5, 12 and 5, uh, 14, being in lockstep with God, being one who learns from the wisdom of Christ, is supposed to make you very, very wise. Where, and I often say this, whereas by now many of you listening to me should be deep in the word, should be able to teach it now. And as the scripture says in Hebrews, and many of you still stand in need to be taught yourselves. You got to go back to the ABCs, the elementaries of the very word of God. And the point here is when God gives you wisdom, you're supposed to benefit from it and ultimately to know what is right and what is wrong. 
And you see here, God gave Solomon so much wisdom, he knew about animals in depth, trees. I mean, he knew about everything, if you will, because he was walking in lockstep with God. He was letting God dominate his life. Our admonition today to you, to, and the word is to me as well, let God run your life or you will end up losing the blessed kingdom God has given you right now to rule, which is your life. Listen to this. I want to go back to uh, 20, verse 20 of, uh, four, of, of chapter 4. Solomon got the wisdom, right? And now what, he, what we see here is Solomon had orderliness in his life. Listen to this. Verse 20 of chapter 4. Judah and Israel were as numerous as the sands of the sea in multitude, eating and drinking and rejoicing. So Solomon reigned over all kingdoms, not just over the Hebrew people, over all kingdoms from the river, that is the Euphrates. Where's the Euphrates? That's today in Iraq. Back then, Assyria. But look at, I want you to see something. Solomon didn't just rule what we know today as Israel. Solomon's uh, reign was larger than even David's. And you'll see if you read from, verse, from chapter 1 that when Solomon became king, they prayed that Solomon would outdo David in his kingdom, and he did. God blessed Solomon that much where Solomon ruled more land than even David his father. Solomon was richer than David his father. Solomon had more tributes paid to him than David his father. But that's, every father wants his son to do better than he, and even David endorsed that. But I want you to see this. Solomon ruled from the Euphrates, not just where you see today Israel is. Let's use today's countries. He ruled from Iraq all the way to the border of Egypt. This was what Solomon ruled over. He says, from the river, which means the Euphrates, to the land of the Philistines, and as far as the border of Egypt, they brought tribute and served Solomon all the days of his life. Do you see how broad his kingdom got? That's far larger than the land of Canaan, which Abraham first uh, went to. Far larger. But I want you to see this too. The land that the Lord promised Israel is far greater than the borders we see today uh, that little Israel has. Solomon ruled, I want to get this to you, in lockstep with God. God blessed him from the Euphrates down to the border of Egypt. All lands and peoples in between, if you look it up, God blessed him to have the reign over. What is that saying? God will bless your life, my life, whoever, to be very rich. I don't mean monetarily only. To be very full in your span of influence in your life. You'll have every area of your life under control if you let God reign over you. You the king, I the king, whoever over your own lives, have, we all have one king over us. And unless we learn, and until we learn, to let him reign and rule in our lives, we'll never have a successful reign in our kingdom, which is our lives. But let, let's move on. Solomon is having a, su a successful reign, right? As many of us are. Start off with the Lord, come, you repent, get baptized. You, have, you already have, you have the Holy Ghost when you repent it. You get baptized and you're living a successful Christian life. Right? Then sometimes you can become complacent. And then sometimes you can let that seed that was in you, that you brought with you when you came to the Lord, that you never let go of, you can let that, that seed of, of uh, destruction fester or grow. And it can end up, it can end up being your downfall. But I, that's just for the sake of uh, consistency here. You'll see from verses five, uh, chapters 5 through 8, Solomon builds the temple. His kingdom is very successful. You know, the temple is so beautiful. All the inside is overlaid with gold. It's just magnificent, right? And all of this is going on. He have, he's having a successful reign. The queen of Sheba comes to get his wisdom. The surrounding kings come to hear from him. They're, everyone's amazed at his wisdom. And Solomon is, is having a successful reign, as many of us do today. Don't forget, the whole idea behind the book of the Kings is to show us how God blesses someone when you are in submission to him. And if you read for yourself between uh, ver uh, chapters 1 and 11 of 1 Kings, you'll see 
basically Solomon's reign uh, summarized. But I want to jump over to uh, chapter 11 because we're going to see Solomon's big problem. Now, as I said, between 5 and 8, you see the temple being built, then you have the kings coming in 9 and 10, and they're getting Solomon's wisdom. Everyone's impressed. Solomon has a great reign, a great kingdom. God is blessing him because he's doing what David told him to do, follow the Lord, follow his word, stay in line with God's edicts. And he's doing what God told him, keep my ways, I will lengthen your days, I will bless you, you'll be blessed beyond any uh, person uh, naturally. I already gave you the wisdom, he says, see, behold, I made you wiser now. Now follow my words and I'll give you what you didn't ask for. But here's the test, Solomon, and each one of us is a Solomon. God tests us. Don't ask for something over and over and see if God doesn't give it to you. And sometimes he'll give it to you to test you, to correct you, to put you on the right path. And you, you may say, I never mouth, I never asked for that. Don't you know God knows what's in your heart? You don't have to ask for it with your mouth. Solomon never asked for those riches, did he? But did God give them to them? Give them to him? Yes, he did because God knew what was in Solomon's heart. So if you still are yearning for your Egypt, yearning for ways that are not like God, God will often give you the wherewithal to have what it is you secretly desire and it may be your downfall because God wants what he wanted and found in David. Someone whose heart really yearns after him. When you wake up in the morning, I want God. When you wake up, in the, even when I'm wrong, I want God. When God is correcting me, Lord, it hurts your chastening, but I want you. You're right. Thank you, Lord, for your correction. God wants that heart that is sincere and that when we're being corrected, you say, like David said, Lord, just don't take your joy from me. I'm willing to take your punishment and your correction, but create in me a clean heart. Notice he didn't say, make my heart over. He said, create in me another heart. I want a clean heart. He didn't, David was so desirous of God running his life and being in lockstep with God, that God's will would run his life, that David said, Lord, just take my old heart, get rid of it, and create in me a new one. Meaning, make a new person out of me. And this is what we all should say to God today. Lord, if there's something not right about me, create in me a clean heart and renew in me a right spirit. Because the spirit you have in you is the spirit you're always going to have. You just want him to renew in you a right one. Make it correct. Renew in me a right spirit. And whatever you do, Lord, don't take your joy from me. What does that mean? Don't leave me. Even when you're punishing me, I'll take your punishment, Lord. I've sinned against you, David was saying. That's the kind of heart that was sought in Solomon and not quite found because Solomon managed to hold on to, and we, we'll read ver, uh, chapter 11 here, Solomon managed to hold on to that thing which was his downfall. He had that, that root of uh, worldliness in him. He started off with dependence on God. Yes, God set him up. Mm -hmm. He got the wisdom of God. God made him wiser than anybody else, yes. God gave him order. His kingdom he ruled from the Euphrates to the border of Egypt. There was order. Everyone brought him tribute. He ruled all those various peoples, all the different kingdoms. There was order in his kingdom. His enemies were defeated. Solomon was successful. And here we come to a warning for all of us today. And we're going to leave on this note, but I want this to go home to everyone today. The whole purpose of you ruling over your kingdom, me ruling over my kingdom, which is my life, your life, the whole purpose of it is to learn that we have to let God rule us. Then you will have a successful reign over your kingdom. And I, want, I use Solomon because you see, he's a perfect example of someone who had a great and beautiful kingdom. It was running just like God wanted. Everything, he was prosperous beyond measure, wiser than any before or after him. Of course, Jesus exempted. Jesus is the one that gave him the knowledge, so we're not talking of Jesus. Uh, but Solomon, you'll see at chapter 11, verse 1, here it is. The one thing that he just could not shake, the one thing that showed he was no David in terms of his heart. But King Solomon loved many foreign women as well as the daughter of Pharaoh. By the way, Pharaoh's daughter was his most prominent 
wife. And you'll notice back in uh, chapter 3, that's the first one it mentions. He made a peace treaty and a marriage uh, treaty with uh, the Pharaoh to marry his daughter, which is, a, as I said, symbolic of the world. So he brought the world with him. But it says, he loved many foreign women as well as the daughter of Pharaoh. Women of the Moabites, the Ammonites, the Edomites, the Sidonites, some of you will have a Z for Zidonites, same, same people, same place, the Hittites, and from the nations of whom the Lord, listen to this, this is where Solomon was wrong, and from the nations of whom the Lord had said to the children of Israel under Moses, you shall not intermarry with them, nor they with you. Surely they will what? Turn you away, turn away your hearts after their gods. That was God's whole purpose. God had nothing against those people ethnically. God is not a racist. He's not a bigot. He's not prejudiced. God's point was they will turn you toward other gods. And back then, as I said, God called out Israel and made them a people that he would have a special relationship with to show the whole world this is how it is when you are in lockstep with me. When, when you follow God's way, look at how Israel got blessed. Look at David. First of all, he blessed Saul till Saul went wrong. Then he said, give me a man of my own heart. Give me David. And David and Solomon were examples of how to run a kingdom, except for their human frailties, which God did correct. But by and large, a successful kingdom is run like David and Solomon did, of course, until Solomon got to this point. Chapter 11 of 1 Kings. He loved many foreign women. And God said, don't do that in Moses, because they will turn you to other gods. So, now listen to this, saints. This is very important. Solomon clave or clung to those in love. He didn't just have them uh, frivolously. Or, or Solomon loved these women. And he really wanted them. Watch this. He had 700 wives. What kind of wives? These were all royal princesses. Solomon loved them. And then he had 300 concubines. I know... A lot of men in their vanity say, boy, I wish I had 700 wives and three. No, you don't. You can't handle the one you have. Please, the one you have, you'll make out all right. But listen to this. He, he didn't just have them. He, cleaved, he clung to them in love. Solomon, what did Jesus say in Luke 12? I believe it is 12, 34. What did Jesus say? Wherever your treasure is, that's where your heart's going to be. This is showing us Solomon didn't just have them say, hey, I have a bunch of work. Solomon really went for them. He loved them. He clung to them in love. And he had 700 princesses as wives. These are the daughters of other kings. And he had 300 concubines, sort of servant wives, if you will. And his wives turned his heart away. The whole message today is about don't let anything turn your heart away from God. If you're going to have a successful reign over your kingdom, which is your life, keep his statutes, keep his testimonies, follow God's ways, read his word, know what's in it, and then live it. Don't just talk it. Do what he said do. Love the way he said love. Worship the way he said worship. How? By showing one another love. And be sincere when you come to God with your devotion. Do not be turned away. This was Solomon's downfall. He took from the world something that, would, that he would keep so precious to him that his heart went after it, the love of those women. And you see, the, uh, the riches that God gave him, this all went part and parcel with his falling away from God. A test. Don't say it's, it, it wasn't fair of God to do that. God knows what he's doing. What God did, if you listen to the word, God used those things to bring out what was really in Solomon's heart. Just as God allowed what he did with David to bring out what was in David's heart, that's why we have that blessed 51st Psalm today. Create in me a clean heart. Renew in me a right spirit. That was really in David. In spite of David's carnal weakness, Murder and adultery, which is horrible, two of the worst. David, what was really in David was brought out. When he got down on the ground and pled to the Lord, Lord, just don't take your joy from me. The most important thing to me, have my kingdom, take all my riches, but don't take your joy from me. Where Solomon's plea, and you see, well, Solomon's real heart, I should say, shows, it says he cleaved to them in love. Solomon loved these women. 
David loved the Lord with all that was in him. He loved the Lord and he showed it. David was willing to give up everything. Just don't take your joy from me. And isn't that our cry to God today? Lord, no matter how sinful, how weak I can be, just don't leave me. Don't take your joy from me. Create in me a clean heart. Make me how I have to be to please you, God. Whatever you do, just don't, don't turn, for, don't take your joy from me. Uphold me with your free spirit, but just don't take your joy from me. And that is the difference between David and Solomon. Someone who is willing to let God lead, rule, correct, chasten, order your life, as opposed to someone who loves the Lord in your way, but you still want to hold on to something of the world, even if God said, don't do that. I still want it, Lord. Nope. Solomon, here, here was his downfall. Don't let this be your downfall, saints. Be willing to let Egypt go, metaphorically. God bless all Egyptians. I have to keep saying that. We have nothing against Egyptians. But be willing to let worldliness go. Be willing to let anything go that won't let you walk in the paths that the Lord has set. How do we know? Well, God has told you, O oh man, what is good. He's already shown you. Have we not learned that from Micah? He's shown you, O oh man. Why did it say, O oh man? It's speaking to all human beings on the planet. You know what's right, but where is your treasure? What do you really treasure? Because that you can believe, as Jesus said, that's where your heart's going to be. Solomon showed us what he really treasured. Let me read on. Verse, let me go back to uh, verse 3. And he had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. For it was so, when Solomon was old, that his wives turned his heart after other gods, and his heart, listen to this, saints, was not loyal to the Lord his God. Even the scripture still says it was his God, but he wasn't loyal to him. I'm saying this so saints today can see you can still have the outward appearance as Solomon did of everything very appealing. But is he still the Lord your God in your inward parts like it was with David? Notice it says he followed the Lord and everything except he didn't follow him just like David, his father did. Because David's heart was real toward the Lord. It says his heart was not loyal to the Lord his God as was the heart of David his father. For Solomon went after Ashtoreth, these are false gods, these are fertility gods, and saints, it gets pretty gross that I'm not going to share all the details, but Ashtoreth, goddess of the Sidonians, and Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites, Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord and did not fully follow the Lord, as did his father David. Listen to this one. Solomon built a high place for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab, on the hill that is east of Jerusalem. That's the Mount of Olives. In this very holy and sacred place, he built an altar for Chemosh. That's that smiling, hideous god, false god, with that hideous smile on his face, which they, this is hard to uh, even say, they sacrificed children to this god by throwing them in fire alive. This so... Uh, abhorred God. This is such an abomination to God that this is one of the worst abominations. And look at Solomon. He didn't just go work. He built an altar. He built a, 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 a high place for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab, on the hill that is east of Jerusalem, most likely the Mount of Olives, and for Molech, the abomination of the people of Ammon. And he did likewise for all his foreign wives who burn incense and sacrifices to their gods. This is the wisest man ever the earth has seen other than Jesus. What does this tell you? When a man thinks he stands, take heed lest he fall. You can't become so complacent and take God for granted and think that your outward show and display is fooling God in any way. God knows our hearts. He knows who's sincere. He knows who has that heart like David, who really yearned for God inwardly, where we're going to let God reign over our lives, even when it's not popular with your friends. You say and do and live what is right according to the word of God. And we, what do we mean? No retaliation. You don't strike back. You're not, um, 
devising evil against people. You're constantly forgiving. You're loving. You're long-suffering. You're emulating God. You, when you have a heart that is ordered by God, you're going to do as David did. And that is when you mess up, you're going to repent and sincerely repent. And you're going to ask him to create in you a clean heart, renewing you a right spirit. And Lord, just don't leave me. Don't take your joy from me. And I'm never, Lord, going to succumb to the weaknesses of Solomon, where you keep some of the world's so much and so precious to you that you can't turn fully to God in devotion. Listen to this. Where am I? Verse uh, 8. Let me start at verse 8, chapter 11. We're talking about Solomon's demise, which could be your downfall too if you don't watch it, holding on too much to too much of the world. And he did likewise for all his foreign wives who burned incense and sacrifices to their gods. So the Lord became angry with Solomon because his heart had turned from the Lord God of Israel who had appeared to him twice. The Lord even came to him twice and appeared to him and had commanded him, the Lord himself commanded him concerning this thing, that he should not go after other gods, but he did not keep uh, what the Lord had commanded him. Meaning the, the Lord himself appealed to Solomon. Have you ever had the Lord just hit your conscience over and over telling you something is wrong? And you, we can have a way of ignoring the Lord and justifying to ourselves why we're doing what we're doing. This is what Solomon did, but to his own detriment. And he better thank God, as we all do today, for grace. Because because of David, Solomon is saved. Listen to this. Therefore, the Lord said to Solomon, because you have done this and have not kept my commandment and my statutes, which I have commanded you, I will surely tear the kingdom away from you and give it to your servant. Nevertheless, I will not do it in your days, for this, why? Not for your sake, Solomon, for the sake of your father, David. I will tear it out of the hands of your son. However, I will not tear it away. I will not tear away the whole kingdom. This is all because of his love for David. I will not tear away the whole kingdom. I will give uh, one tribe to your son for the sake of my servant, David, and for the sake of Jerusalem, which I have chosen. Now, why did it say for the sake of Jerusalem? Because the kingdom that he gave him became Judah, whose capital was Jerusalem. And someone will say, but I thought you said the southern kingdom, which Solomon's son Rehoboam got, was comprised of the tribe of Judah and of Benjamin. Yes, but the Lord said, I'll give you one tribe. Why? Because one full tribe of Judah, the full tribe, was dedicated to Rehoboam, Solomon's son, who also went wicked. But part of the tribe of Benjamin joined Judah. That's why you'll read later that Benjamin and Judah comprised the southern kingdom of Judah because not all of the tribe of Benjamin, some was, were aligned with the north, northern kingdom and some with the southern kingdom. So that's why the Lord says, I will give you one tribe, meaning one full tribe, that would be Judah. So Judah joined Rehoboam, Solomon's son, and Solomon's son's reigns went, reign went on through the southern kingdom, which we went over recently, was taken into captivity in 586 BC by Nebuchadnezzar. But the one kingdom that is referenced did comprise part of Benjamin. So that's why sometimes you'll see two tribes made up Judah, but technically the Lord is correct here because one full tribe was given to Solomon's son. But the Lord was still so gracious with Solomon, he said, not in your day will it happen, but in your son's day. But the Lord began to plant the seeds of rebellion. If you go on and read the adversaries from verse 14 on in chapter 11, we're going to stop here today. You'll see the adversaries of Solomon. The Lord allows that to happen. And the Lord says in another place, I'm working this rebellion against you, Solomon. Didn't I tell you it's going to come? Because the Lord wants us to look at these kings in the book of Kings and see how this relates to us individually. It's not just to give us a historical account. We can get that from a lot of secular uh, history books. But the Lord is showing us each individual believer right now listening that when God gives you authority over your own kingdom, you are to do what? What the Lord told Solomon, what David told Solomon. Be in complete submission to the Lord's domination. Let the Lord reign over you while you reign over your own kingdom, which is your life. Let God have complete control. How do you do that? Well, oh man, he's already shown you what is good, says Micah. And then we know from plenty of examples in scripture, 
and especially in uh, Romans, God has written on the heart of every man really what is right and what is wrong. But when we have specific scriptures and word of God to, to warn us and admonish us, you will have a successful reign over your kingdom, that is your life, if you let the Lord your God have complete reign over you and your will. God bless you one and all. Peace be unto you. I hope this message went home to you today that you will let the Lord reign in your life forever. God bless each and every one of you. Peace be unto you. Mm -hmm.